Hey, we're still in New York, and I've got Jill Duffy and Dan Patterson here. Hi, everybody. Who Hi. let you guys in? Oh, my. I didn't see you there. <laughs> thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having us. This is going to be fun. Now, apologies for making you stand, uh, but I think this is going to work better that way. Make sure to speak into the mic, Dan. I know you. Yeah, I know you're yeah. as an audio we're professional. Just, you've never, uh, never you've never dealt with that before. But all right, I think I'm ready. You guys are ready. Let's yeah. do it. Here we go. The Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt is brought to you by wonderful, awesome patrons like you. If that's not you, join this party now. Go to Patreon.com/slash/AceDetect and give a little. Because it helps a lot. That's patreon.com slash A C E D T E C T. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 14th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt, and joining me today, Jill Duffy from PCMag.com. Thank you for coming. And Dan Patterson, tech journalist and sometimes bear fighter in my imagination. Great to be here. <laughs> How's it going, man? Nice to see you. <laughs> Good to have you back. It's a uh, you've got a new uh, show out, the Signal Podcast. Yeah, I think so. We'll talk about that uh, a little later. Yeah, yeah. Jill might have something to do with that. Show. I might have something to say about that. Show. Well, we'll have a lot to say about that. But let's start off with the headlines. No, no seriously, the headlines. There we go. TechCrunch noted that Dropbox confirmed 400 account credentials posted to Pastebin were in fact. For Dropbox accounts, Security Chief Anton Mityagin drop, said Dropbox was not hacked. These were users who had the same password at Dropbox as other services. Most of the credentials had already been caught and deactivated, and the rest have now been reset, so none of them uh, were used on Dropbox for any malicious purpose, according to them. Several hundred more credentials were posted later, but Dropbox says, yeah, those were not real. Those are not associated with Dropbox accounts. We're going to talk about this in our main topic. The next web reports that Google's same-day delivery service is no longer free. Also got a name change. Google Shopping Express is now just Google Express and brings groceries and other purchases from various stores to your door at a convenient time. Service now costs 5 bucks per order, more if you want alcohol, though you can subscribe for $95 a year or $10 a month and not only get uh, all your orders without extra charge but get first dibs on delivery windows. Memberships can be shared with people in your house. Google also added new retailers including Barnes & Noble and Nine West Shoes, which is important to me, and expanded from San Francisco, LA, and New York to include Chicago, Boston, and Washington, DC. Have you guys ever used this out here? I've, I tried to use it once and then my Google wallet failed. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, that one's not for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's why they're doing this. They're like, no, seriously, pay pay money and try it. Uh, no, they had it for free to get people to try it, but I just didn't work for me. That, do you see this as an Amazon Prime competitor? Because Amazon Prime has so much more going on. I think it's trying to be. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it'll get there. Particularly the comments that Google has made lately uh, about Amazon being their primary search competitor. I think that they're making little intonations uh, at, directed at Amazon, and this could be one of those. PC Mag reports August smart locks will be coming to Apple Store shelves this week for $249.99. The smart lock works in single cylinder deadbolts and and create virtual keys on smartphones. Keys can be given to friends through the app and even revoked when necessary. It also works with physical keys as well. This would be great. I mean, this kind of thing is, is not the first one, but this is going to put this sort of technology in more people's hands, and it's great for when you have friends staying or someone watching your house or whatever. You don't have to go get those keys made. Yeah, you can just give Good them. You make sure they have an app. And then the people watching your, your dogs or your cats don't have a phone. With the right app. Just think about how quickly something. you can change the lock. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Skype has a new mobile messaging service called Quick. Yeah, remember they bought Quick and then yeah. they ignored Quick, then they shut down Quick. Uh, well, now the name is back. Users can share video clips up to 42 seconds. They disappear after two weeks, or the sender can delete them at any time. There's also Quick Flicks which are five-second clips available on the Android and iPhone apps coming to Windows Phone soon. Blocking other users is available for Android and Windows Phone, but not the iPhone app. Can't block anybody on iPhone. And now that I made Dan my friend, I stuck with him. <laughs> we were trying this earlier. Yeah, it was it worked okay. The problem is always, or the challenge at least, is need. Do we need this? And, you know, there are maybe some use cases, but uh, it's questionable. Yeah, I... I I, like I said in, in our little quick exchange, yeah. I thought camera phones and instant messenger were stupid when they first arrived as well, so I could be wrong about this, but I'm not sure 
we need it. They have an interesting interface that allows you to see the conversation and play it back. Yeah. I found that interesting later. Well, yeah, and you know, Jill, you and I use the uh, the Apple Messenger phone to, to share audio messages about the show, right? Hey, yeah. got an idea? Here's a quick message. Although the video is almost usually, I look terrible, or I'm walking down the street, or like you don't need to see me. Yeah, Please and it, don't. And the market's already so saturated. So if there yeah. isn't a unique hook on this, why would anybody adopt it now? I think you're right. Washington Post reports that the FCC is considering Aereo's request to be classified as a multi-channel video provider just like a cable or satellite company, subject to all the rules and regulations of cable and satellite companies. Now, that means something good for Aereo in this case. They could start negotiating with broadcast networks for retransmission fees. That may sound like a bad thing, but right now, no Internet video providers are classified as MPVDs, and so they're basically ignored. The networks will say, no, we're not even going to negotiate with you. So if Aereo were to get classified as an MPVD, it would have to pay more for content, but the networks would have to let them pay that more for content. PC Mag reports iSight Partners announced a zero-day Windows vulnerability today. Uh, it says Russian attackers are using it against U.S., European, and Ukrainian government agencies, NATO, telecom companies, an unnamed U.S. academic organization. The attacks are attributed to a group nicknamed Sandworm Team because of their frequent references to the Dune series. Security experts have been tracking the five-year-old group referred to as Quedec by F-Secure since late 2013. I don't want to say I like a team, but I do like Dune. Like, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Clever hackers. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't they always, though? Android police report on a leaked Google ad featuring little Android characters with the slogan, Be Together, Not the Same. It includes an animated version of the Nexus 6 running Android L. The video comes with a link to a page on the Android site that isn't yet live, but it could be if the Nexus 6 is announced, which Forbes speculates may be happening as early as tomorrow. Do you, do you think they would do that the day before an Apple announcement? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I I should I need to recuse from from. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, time now for some news from you. These are submitted on our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. If you haven't jumped in there. Go take a look. There's like 3,000 people in there submitting stories, voting them up or down. Uh, we're getting a good amount of votes on these stories now, so we can really start to tell which ones you really like and which ones uh, you like less. Alan A.V. submitted the Tech Dirt story about a comment on the U.S. FCC's open Internet guidelines filed by VPN company Golden Frog. The company describes evidence that a wireless broadband provider, they're not named, actively blocked S-T-R-T-T-L-S encryption. Start... TTLS encryption, preventing a user from encrypting SMTP email traffic. Golden Frog described the provider as modifying messages in transit. In one case, from 250 start TLS to 250 XXXXXXXXA, causing encryption not to be started. Uh, th there have been other complaints, and in fact, Golden Frog had some complaints about Netflix performing better in a VPN than others, but there, there are some very non-controversial reasons for that what happening. I can't think, and maybe I'm missing it, of a non-controversial reason why a wireless provider would be killing encryption over their network. Can you guys? No, but it's yeah. It's hard to, to make assumptions. As, you know, I mean, you're overriding a request in transit. That's a man, that definition of a man-in-the-middle attack, yeah. if, if this is true, right? Like, we only have golden frogs worded for it. Yeah, assumptions are hard. TM204 passed along the Science Daily report that researchers at Nanyang Technological University have developed a battery that can be recharged to 70% capacity in two minutes and have a more than 20-year lifespan. NTU Singapore scientists replaced the graphite used for the anode, that's the negative pull, in lithium-ion batteries with a new gel made from titanium dioxide. That's the same stuff in, in some of your sunscreen. The nanostructure of titanium dioxide helps speed up chemical reactions. Get very excited about battery stories, and they never pay off. Well, I think they do, but maybe not directly, right? That, so not like, immediately. Our, right? our yeah, battery yeah, life yeah. has gotten incredible. Yeah. This is great stuff, though. Yeah. No, I, I, one day this will all pay off. You're absolutely right. Alan A.V. posted the Wired story about the launch of Kickstarter funding for Anonabox. The $45 open source router directs all data through Tor, hiding the user's IP address. Apparently the box is tiny enough for two to fit in a pack of cigarettes. Uh, and so it's not the first tour in a box, but the hope is that it strikes the best balance between cost, 45 bucks, setup, it's supposed to be plug and play, size, obviously, and security. The project is open source, but has not been audited yet for security. 
I love this idea, though. Just plug it in on the side on your Ethernet. doesn't matter where you go. You're on tour. Mm, routers are tough. Yeah. Routers are tough to get You're skeptical. Right, I think. Yeah. Well, and it's in Kickstarter phase still. I, I need to see something working yeah. first. Yeah. Nobody's tested it yet. Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, anything that makes this type of encryption easier is also going to add more and more flags. And it's very easy to see, okay, these are the encrypted networks that are the encrypted traffic. And it's all right, very easy to spot that and, and uh, signal it out. Finally, Bishma submitted the TechCrunch story that Dorian Nakamoto is suing Newsweek for writing the article claiming he was the creator of Bitcoin. Nakamoto denied creating the cryptocurrency, says he was targeted and victimized by a reckless news organization. Nakamoto created a web page asking for donations to his legal case. And yes, in case you're wondering, you can donate by check, money order, credit card, and Bitcoin. Which, I mean, why, why wouldn't he? Obviously, he's going to have a lot of people who have Bitcoins wanting to help him out. And that's a look at the headlines. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this Dropbox uh, story. Uh, 400 Dropbox credentials. There have been more posted, but apparently Dropbox says they weren't real. But they do say these first 400 were real. Uh, Dropbox says the usernames and passwords referenced in these articles were stolen from unrelated services, not Dropbox. Attackers then used these stolen credentials to try to log into sites across the Internet, including Dropbox. So they're essentially trying to calm the... Dropbox got hacked fears and say, no, we never got hacked. This was, you know, people out there hacking Home Depot and Target like crazy, and then they're trying out all of the credentials that they find, and if they work, then they collate it all together. Now, Natasha Lomas over at TechCrunch says, great, that's, you know, that's a fair point, but Dropbox could force everybody to do two-factor authentication. Do we think they should? I don't think so. No? I mean, I Not their responsibility. So the first thing I think when Dropbox said we didn't get hacked, technically that is true. And I would say they didn't play the blame game. They didn't say you users are to blame for reusing these passwords, right. which I think kind of is the case. I think on some level you have to be smart, you have to be savvy, you have to use a password manager. That is like a drum that I will beat until the day I die, until the day <laughs> well, we fix passwords. Yeah, yeah. Right? Passwords are fundamentally broken. They're not a good way of protecting your data. You can go at Dropbox from a couple of different angles because they certainly don't do everything they possibly could to keep your data safe, encrypted, um, and secure, but I don't think, I mean, if you were asking Dropbox to, to mandate two-factor authentication, you'd have to do that with every site, and users would hate it, and then they wouldn't want to use those sites who, that mandate that. Well, I think, I think mandating two-factor authentication is one potential solution here, but it kind of bypasses the responsibility argument, and that is, to what degree do we hold companies like Dropbox responsible, not just for implementing things like two-factor, that is one solution, but they also have a responsibility to educate their customer and to encourage best practices, right? So it's it's all well and good for us who are geeks and know about two, like password managers and such. And I don't think that that invalidates the ignorance of of a person, right? It's not my fault if I'm a layperson and I just use Dropbox. I didn't know about two factor. I didn't know about real great password security. Maybe I should, but. At the end of the day, I'm using a service that hasn't encouraged me to use any safer practices. If you remember the early days of Twitter, they would often put little flags that would say, never log into an account that is not Twitter.com. Never use your Twitter username and password, which is a responsible solution for this, as opposed to a binary. It must be two-factor or nothing. It seems like there is a responsibility on the part of all sites to encourage best practices. Now, let's say Dropbox, and Dropbox does some things like that, uh, but let's say they, they go whole hog and they do everything you want, and people say, oh, but you're not making me? Two-factor authentication sounds hard and a pain, which I know people who use Google and Twitter yep. say, yeah, I, I didn't do that. It was too much of a pain. The purpose then what is not say? necessarily to make the customer safer. It is to deflect, not deflect, that sounds uh, too political, but <laughs> now you're to, to sound spin. Yeah, yeah. Say, look, we did everything we could up to the line of forcing you to do this. Like, we, we can't responsibly do anything more than inform you. This is what we did to inform you. Now, look at Snapchat. Uh, you brought this up uh, earlier today when we were talking over email. Snapchat's API is apparently very easy to be reverse engineered. That's A great. third-party app was doing that, getting people to use it. Snapchat says, we very much encourage people not to use these third-party apps because they're insecure. 
And some response from developers is, yeah, well, if you had an open API, you could control tokens for third-party apps. You'd be able to revoke uh, unscrupulous apps. You wouldn't have to rely on the app stores to police this. Uh, maybe the uh, API should still be less easy to reverse engineer, but, but you know, it would be much better. And Snapchat in their blog post today said it takes time and a lot of resources to build an open and trustworthy third-party application ecosystem. Don't get us wrong. We're excited by the interest in developing for the Snapchat platform, but we're going to take our time to get it right. This is another example of that same line of them saying, well, the, the responsibility is on you not to use these third-party apps. This is good communication, though. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is much better. Snapchat has learned from that last mistake they had where their communication was very poor. It was pretty much like, screw you if you got your number stolen. This is much better and more responsible communication. It's explaining, look, this is why it's hard to do. Like, you can't expect, you know, Rome to be built in a day. This is what we're doing to work on it. But shouldn't they have an open API by now? Yeah, no? sure. They're valued at 10 billion bucks. Of course they should. <laughs> what do you think, Joe? Well, the, the one thing that is nagging me about both of these conversations is the content that might potentially be hacked or compromised, right? So in the case of Snapchat, okay, since the day that this app came out, we've all been saying, don't put dirty pictures on the internet, don't put dirty pictures <laughs> on Snapchat. Everything is vulnerable to some kind of attack. Everything can be reproduced if it's digital. So that's the first thing, right? Like, is what are we actually talking about potentially being compromised? In the case of Dropbox, I think, again, it's the responsibility of people to be careful. Like, you shouldn't put a copy of your passport in Dropbox, probably. Um, the thing that I'm thinking about, though, is businesses. Dropbox has made yeah. a big, big piece of its own business out of offering business plans. So that data is sensitive. It is critical. I have a feeling that none of those passwords or usernames, password combinations would have been posted. I don't know. But I have a hunch that it's probably all personal user accounts, um, if, especially if they're coming from somewhere else. But I, I, th that's the part that sort of troubles me that the tech community maybe not be talking about as much, is what is the content that's really at risk here? Yeah, and Dropbox, to be able to be successful, needs to assure people, if you put your passport photo here, it will be safe. Uh, and yeah. and they say that, and we can get into the whole other side of it where Edward Snowden points out, yeah, but they hold the encryption keys. If the government comes, they can get your, your stuff. But barring Dropbox handing over encryption keys, Dropbox is securable, right? But it comes back to the same thing we keep talking about, which is, you have to take responsibility for that. Yeah. You have to turn on two-factor authentication or set up a text messaging or make sure you've got a, a password manager so you're not using the same passwords at multiple sites, like all the best practices of password management. Yeah. That's too hard for most people. I and mean, Dan, you, you talked about that earlier. Like Most people just don't want to have to deal with that. Well, and this could be, this, these could be signals, flags of a new era less naive era of the web, right? So we had the first bubble, which was the expansion of the web. We, we had the rise of social media and web 2.0, which was a very, you know, we were exuberant, very excited to build these things and making it as, as uh, convenient as possible. And Jill, you said earlier in the pre-show that we're, you know, it's just easier, you know, two-factor creates a barrier. This may be the time where we now, if you're using the web, you just have to be more sophisticated. We are less naive than we were 10 years ago and we just have to, you either take on good responsibility or suffer the consequences and it may be enough friends getting burned that uh, in five years we're a more sophisticated society when it comes to using passwords in the web. I'm really excited for passwords to just disappear. Yes. There's a whole bunch of wonderful security companies who are working on alternatives to passwords. Um, one of the ones that I've seen recently is the Mimi bracelet. Uh, it uses biomarkers, so in this case your heart signature. But there's lots of things like the retina scanning, even the fingerprint on the iPhone. Um, and the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus will have it for your credit card use. I mean, that's another case where we just do things in the most backward way considering the technology that we have at our disposal today. The way that we use credit cards, especially in the U.S. where we don't even have chip and pin options for the most part, um, it's, it's a broken system and it's, it's easy to hack, it's easy to steal, it's easy to use these, these pieces of data to your own profit, which is what hackers do. They're always trying to make money off of their hacking. Um, so I'm excited to see some innovations in, in getting rid of passwords altogether with other kinds of keys and methods of unlocking uh, our, our online identities. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, the problem with the heart rate 
uh, monitor that I read about was people saying, yeah, but you can't change your password then. Your heart's your heart, right? Yeah. Uh, so it has to always be paired up with another factor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of times, like Touch ID is backed by a password. So if you can hack the password, you can still crack into somebody's phone. I'm like you. I want the password to just die. Like I'm ready for that system that is convincingly reliable that you don't have to remember anything. You don't have to use a manager. Uh, and uh, there have been some people come up with some really interesting approaches to that, but I don't think anybody's cracked it yet. No. That and batteries. <laughs> come on, people. Uh, My money's on batteries first. We wow. For a better password. That feels like a really pessimistic <laughs> assessment. I mean, I mean, look, it, all, it really comes down to any time, we say this over and over, but any time you put something on the web, it is inherently with another yeah. entity. Anytime something is stored with another entity, if it's if it's it can't be protected. It simply can't be protected. The web never forgets. Right, exactly. Yeah. But it's always a trade-off, right? I mean, for the same argument that we say, um, you know, people complain about Facebook owning their data. If you're not paying for it, you're the product. Um, what is the trade-off, though? Is the trade-off that you get to use Dropbox, all your files sync effortlessly, you're happy because your photos are backed up automatically, and the trade-off is that your data is insecure and that you have to take yep. these extra measures to make it more well, secure. I think Dropbox and would say. It is secure. Like they didn't get hacked, but you True. have to take that responsibility. So there's a cost. Right. Yeah. I, I think. I mean, like right. really you might want to take that. Part, I'm fair with yeah. that. That's a, that seems like a good deal on my part. Yeah, the the trade is you have to do some work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah at this point, although I pay for Dropbox, I pay them. Come on. Yeah. I just switched. And I have. To they have two factor authentication. Spider Oak. Yeah. Yeah. Can. Actually, I use Spider Oak as well. Yeah. Dropbox. For things that I don't care if the government were to find. Right. Dropbox for comic books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally legitimately acquired comic books. Uh, well, thank you guys. That was a good conversation. Uh, Appreciate that. Thanks. Let's yeah. take a look at the calendar real quick. Tomorrow, October 15th, earnings released for eBay and Netflix. We'll keep an eye on those. Our pick of the day comes from Ken Shabby. Splash Top. He says, on Monday's show, you discussed attaching PCs to televisions and the problems controlling them with wireless mice and keyboards. My pick, Splash Top a free remote desktop app that makes controlling your computer with your mobile device easy. Splashtop consists of an app you install on your tablet and a streamer program you install on your Mac or PC. Uh, so it's it's essentially uh, you're just tunneling into your PC. You can control your old XP PC using new touch gestures on your tablet. No more trying to use a mouse while in a lazy boy. No more having the giant wireless keyboard flashing around your living room. Uh, if your mobile device doesn't run Flash, you can still view Flash web pages by running them on your PC and streaming them to your mobile device, which is nifty. Uh, it's a VNC. Essentially is what it is. Splashtop allows you to mute the sound on the PC, listen by your mobile device. That way you can plug in the headphones, watch without anyone knowing else, other people in the room. Uh, it works like the Roku 3 remote with the headphone jack. Not sure how well it would work on a phone unless you have really small fingers or a really big phone like the Note. It might be hard to control your computer on a smaller screen. Works fine on my Nexus 7, he says. Uh, I know a friend who uses Splashtop or was using Splashtop to play Hearthstone before Hearthstone came to iPad. Uh, so it's really good for gaming on your tablet when your game is not available for the tablet. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of people out there are like, yeah, it's VNC. I get it. Uh, but Splash Up's a really good one. It's, it's really popular. So thanks for the pick. Not too shabby, Ken Shabby. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Do you guys attach a PC? What, how do you watch Internet video? Do, do you have anything connected I have, right now I have an Apple TV on my TV. The TV is a smart TV, but it's not that smart, so we need the Apple TV for things that I can't do. Um, and then I watch, you know what, I'm really bad. I listen to TV and Netflix, especially while I'm at work. So I just, just have dual, monitor, not, dual monitor, yeah, on the laptop, let it go. I don't watch so much on mobile devices, though. Yeah, me either, actually. Not Maybe on much. an airplane right. from time to time. Right, on a tablet yeah. on an airplane. Dan? Yeah, I'm Roku, Apple TV, and Chromecast, and I toggle between them. And uh, right, very similar actually. I'll put something on in the background, and then yeah. not. Yeah, I'm an audio person. I'll listen to television, but uh, 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 all three. Interesting. Yesterday's show, we were talking about uh, the article in The Verge about you should hook a PC up to your TV. It's the best thing possible. And Ayaz and I kicked that around. We got lots of great emails about your PCs in your living rooms. John in Dawsonville said, I use a desktop that's a bit outdated but still has HDMI out hooked up to the TV. Use my laptop with Chrome browser's remote desktop web app. Kind of like Splash Shop. Gives me a keyboard and mouse right 
my easy viewing of what I'm doing. Once I choose what I'm going to watch, I close the laptop and enjoy it on the TV. Dwayne at Rammstein Air Base in Germany got a Surface Pro 3, so he put his Surface Pro 1 connected to the TV. He writes, it has never moved since being put there. It's the ultimate streaming box. I bought the Bluetooth adapter for the touchpad keyboard so I could type from the couch. The perfect media PC was born. Uh, I want to know if he's using Plex or Media Center or what he put on there, but that's interesting. Yeah, you know, Plex is great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did have a few emails from folks that have tried PC in the living room and moved on. Otto uh, wrote in and said, I have a Roku and, or a Fire TV connected to the other TVs in my house. I can see it's Roku and one and Fire on the other because I want mere mortals to have a chance of being able to operate the TV. But for the home theater in my basement, I built a home theater PC because I wanted the best experience for media and gaming with usability being a secondary factor. As it turns out, I can't wait to find a solution that allows me to replace the PC. Here's a few of his issues. Uh, the range of wireless keyboards and mouse, about 10 feet. Sometimes he runs out of room. He had to run a USB adapter over Cat5 to work around that. Uh, Steam is a good interface for games. Plex is great for media. Netflix only streams in its highest quality, though, if you use the Windows 8 Modern UI app. So he has to bounce in or out of all of these interfaces. Uh, of course, keeping everything updated. Software updates are always a pain. He does recommend Chocolatey NuGet. Uh, to help with those updates. And PC power management wasn't really built with set-top boxes in mind. Uh, he says, the list continues. None of these is insurmountable. I'm sure there are workarounds that I've covered. Nonetheless, I keep hoping that Steam's in-home streaming improves and Plex's audio problems on Fire TV get resolved. Uh, and then Mike Teese, uh, let's see if I can get to Mike Teese. Uh, Jester in the uh, Tadpool chat realm writes, just wanted to drop a note about the Living Room PC article you talked about. I just removed my living room PC five months ago after using one since 2009. The PC in the living room took up a good deal of space. It was noisy. Keyboard and mouse wasn't all that useful from across the room for the majority of uses in a Windows environment at 1080p. What we found to be easier was a Chromecast working in concert with our iPhone and iPads. At first, we lived on just Netflix and HBO Go, but a month ago, I installed Plex. It's a recurring theme here. On my home office desktop and set up the Plex app on our touchscreen devices to control it. Everything is now just a few taps away. While not perfect, it's getting better every few weeks. The biggest issue my wife has is being able to quickly pause something because when the iPad goes to sleep, then you wake it up. The majority of apps have a hard time reconnecting quickly to allow you to pause what's playing. I, have you ever run into that where yeah. you're like, no, no, stop, play. I, please reconnect. Uh, PCs are nice, but as with all the current solutions, none of them are perfect for everyone. Thanks, everybody, for writing in. It's good stuff. And thank you guys for uh, making the trip yeah, over. I know it wasn't well, you as far as L.A., really. but, <laughs> but no, for, you know, getting getting out of the uh, the office and coming over here. It was really fun. Uh, Jill Duffy, you can find her work at PCMag.com. Anything in particular to let folks know about? Oh, I have a weekly column called Get Organized. So this is about simple solutions for cleaning up your very messy digital life. Yeah. If Every you're Monday. a digital hoarder, you need to read this. Uh, and TheSignalPodcast.com. Yeah, right. So um, this is both of us, right? Jill and I have been working on this for a month or so. I've probably been kicking around the idea for a couple months, and yeah. uh, we just, as in like this weekend, got the website up. It's thesignalpodcast.com, and the show is not yet uh, uh, composed, but uh, we're we're taking our time with that and making it something that's uh, it sounds pretentious, but crafted. I mean, it it's professional, but it's not like of the professional soul, it's of the like creative soul. Yeah, right? this is just a, a fun project for us where we get to talk about some of the things that we hold near and dear to our hearts and some of the things that are going around on around in New York City, mm. which are sometimes a little underreported, I think, for the rest of the, the world, especially in the tech world. Yeah, check it out, thesignalpodcast.com. It's a beautiful website. You guys did a great job yeah. on that. That's all, awesome. Dan. I can't believe the podcast isn't going to be like Late awesome. Late night coding. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and danpatterson.com uh, as yeah, well? Yeah, I'm, I'm writing for... Uh, right, it's a little outside. I think as my career has progressed, it's moved a little outside of tech. So I'm writing about business for the Washington Post. I'm writing uh, for Gawker uh, some short-form business write, uh, articles. And then contently about uh, doing a 5,000-word piece on uh, church and state in the media mm. here in New York. So I'll talk to a lot of people. Like I think David Carr's on record for this. And like, you know, some of our favorites have... <laughs> It's a media town. We talk about ourselves, so I'm going to write a long <laughs> piece about ourselves. Uh, check it out. Uh, keep keep, in tr keep track at danpatterson.com and, and you're Dan Patterson on Twitter. On Twitter Jill E. Duffy. Jill E. Duffy. Don't forget the E. Uh, 
Thanks, everybody, for your support on Patreon. We are like less than $800 away from reaching the next level, which allows us to bring Justin Robert Young on as a regular contributor. 4,409 folks that are patrons, uh, innumerable folks supporting the show in other ways, whether it's Bitcoin or PayPal or just telling folks about the show. Go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate to find out more about that. Don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshowreddit.com, our e Email feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We have a voicemail too, 51259 daily. That's 512-593-2459. And you can listen to the show live at mobile.alphageekradio.com. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll be back tomorrow with Andrew Zarian. He's going to actually leave Queens and come over here. See you then. about this and other shows, visit frogkids.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Hooray. Hooray. Great discussion. Yeah, that was really good. Thank you, guys. I'm Thank you. The only thing I feel bad about is making you stand through it all, so <laughs> you could have a seat. <laughs> If you want, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna sit down myself. But I usually leave the stream up while I uh, I post the show right away. So make yourselves at home. Jenny will still be around. We got to pick the uh, show title. Jenny, you got and uh, Alpha Geek Radio. You just won't be able to hear her, but everybody else. Will. Um. So uh, at showbot.replex.org, if you guys want to follow along. Oh, this is great. Look at this. Uh. So Big Jim has. Pass holes, comma. We're surrounded by pass holes. Uh, that's four votes. Uh, number three is Google Express from with uh, dollar signs forming the S's uh, from Todd Whitehead. Um, Big Jim again with Aereo again. This time we're cable. Um, Newsweek. Oh, I swear, this time we're cable. Yeah, Newsweek uh, from Beast Beatmaster, of course, spelled W E A K. And my personal favorite. Uh, from T2T2, T2, which, which is, it's my tour in a box. Step one, cut a hole in the box. Uh, which is step just two, really fire up your tour browser. Yeah. <laughs> well, his step two was stick your uh, stick your Ethernet cable in the box. Which, <laughs> well, yeah. Funny. Actually, is legitimately the step. Legitimately the second step. Uh, and then another one from BioCow, which I liked, was TLDR, don't reuse passwords. <laughs> Which is pretty much yeah. That that is the, at, at least as far as like your takeaway of what you can do now. That's just don't definitely do it. the yeah. TLDR. And I'm, let me look. I'll look through the deep cuts here. I don't know. It's uh, my Torna box got the uh, the most reaction from. Yeah, I mean, come on. When you when you have a chance to make a uh, let's see, Dropbox docs dropped. Um. Uh. Yeah, that those top ones are uh, my favorite. I Is it going to really be like... Tor in a Box? I mean, come on. It's going to be Tor in a Box, isn't it? Not only is that not the best title, it's also like a, a cool idea that deserves a little more title space. Like if the Tor really thing? That, yeah, if you really make that work, like make it super easy to be oh, anonymous, that would make me happy. Yeah, me too. I I wanted to get audited and people go, "Wow, it's pretty good." I want to say I like team, but I do like the cats don't have a phone. <laughs> I can't find the start of the show today. Hmm. It's an audio professional unit. The blue show would talk. Yep, there it is. All right, uh, I think. I didn't give myself enough. There we go. Yeah, uh, Who else? <laughs> Jill and Dan, tell me the name of your site again. Um, it's in the doc. Uh, the signal podcast.com. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. 
2014, 10, 14. That's today, right? Yeah. Thank you. Sometimes opening the calendar is just a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You get to see a lot more of the room now. Ooh, people that in the stream. is a nice website. It is, isn't it? It's gorgeous. That. I'm glad it works. <laughs> oh, stop. He's so modest. It has a mixtape on it. Yeah, I forgot you had database. Fantastic. This is a really nice... Um, is this a, a, a WordPress uh, no. theme? Or? No, it's a ghost. Oh, cool. It's mostly, it's derived from WordPress, but it's like uh, all Markdown and PHP. Wow. This is nice. I am adding this link. I'm exporting the MP3, so... Passholes. We're surrounded by passholes. I mean, that's pretty. Crazy. I do like the uh, the idea of the passhole. Yeah. Somehow. But would a passhole? Here's my question: Would a passhole be the person with the sixteen, uh, you know, character hashtag question mark password, or would it be someone who's like password one two three? Hmm. I think it's the people who make us use passwords. Ah. Okay. There you go. The Daily Technique. Worked. <laughs> it actually recorded and everything. Much better than yesterday. <laughs> Keep firing passholes. <laughs> He's really good at like playing devil's advocate and like forcing you to think through it completely. And and right. on was I'm I'm mad that people don't have better taste. Okay. And that's I was like, better. yeah, no, that's not fair at all. Like I didn't keep not sure about that. <laughs> I think we've seen each other since that one thought out. No. I mean, it's cyclical. It is. Wait, wait. Let them know we can still hear them on the podcast. Yeah, that's right. Oh, they know. All right. You know they can still hear you, right? Okay, Okay, they know. (laughs) Okay. Just checking. I had I had a boss when I was like 22, maybe a little older. Like I wanted to play all my indie rock on the you know, the radio. Right Just like I don't give a damn about your indie rock. We play the hits. Why do we play the hits? Because it's about what they like. Yeah. What they like makes us money. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. This is a preview of the Signal podcast. It feels like. <laughs> yeah, yes, it could be. Tom, you want to guess? Absolutely. Guess I'd love to. Maybe Jay should guess too. Yeah, she probably should. She's a New Yorker. I'm a native New Yorker. I actually never had an accent, so I shouldn't even pretend to try. (laughs) I was raised on the Upper West Side. I might as well have been raised in, like, you know. Uh, Yeah, whereabouts? Uh, 89th and Central Park West. Oh, that's wonderful. We have only uh, on 72nd in Amsterdam. Oh, man, classic. That's, uh... That's like right where it meets Broadway, right? Oh, right there, yeah. And the and where it meets my home turf of Grace Papaya. Oh, uh, oh boy, I love that Grace Papaya. 
many a late night, yeah. uh, substantially intoxicated good time was had there. How long did you live here, Jenny? The first 26 years of my life, give or take some forced time in New Jersey and some college in D.C., but, like, it was my, it was pretty actually close to 28, I forget, I came out here in 2002. And you're in L.A.? Um, yeah, so Where? I'm going to, I'm. I moved for love, um, and that's the only thing that would have gotten me to leave New York. She's Hollywood now. Ugh, sounds so terrible. Just terrible. Not Culver City or? No, straight up Hollywood. Like, um, I can see this, like, I can't see the sign, but I can see the sign from a walkable distance from my house. I'm in the flats. I can see the Empire Staple in my house. Oh, that's awesome. Promenade. I can see across the street. Yeah, nice. <laughs> oh, from here, yeah. This is this place it is. If you go, if you're in the kitchen, you can see the the One World Center. Oh, that's a. Freedom Tower. Yeah. Whatever. Freedom Tower. I got a, a tour of that two years ago. I thought we weren't saying Freedom Tower anymore. I see. That's why I keep fumbling around. What What do you What do you call it? All the dudes are doing it. Clone World. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought. Yeah. See. That's why I use both because you You guys are both like saying both. I don't know. What are we? What What's the time? I think we're supposed to call it Microsoft Metro. It's a tiled interface. Harper Collins. I have friends at Harper who just. They're in the building already? Oh, wow. And then all the complex around there. Well, the daily I don't think I've well, been you as far as... I don't know. It's quiet. On the weekends, and at night, yeah. No, below Fulton Street after, like, 5. Oh, okay. It's like, chill. Yeah. It's, it's dead. I'm out of the post, Jenny. <laughs> what? I'm about to go in the post. I'm defending my right who have once lived in a red control department on the Upper West Side. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. All right. I mean, right next to. I'm going to end the stream. Goodbye, video. You goodbye, want to say goodbye? Video. One last goodbye. Here, you can't see Dan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good night. Goodbye.